Welcome into the Atlanta Sports Party, your home for the best Atlanta sports talk. It's local insight. You can't get anywhere else but right here at Locked On. I'm your host, Tanitra Batiste. Alongside me are Jarvis Davis and Maria Martin. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers, join today and you'll get $150 in bonus bets if you're first Bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. And our Atlanta Sports Party is part of our Locked On Sports Network, your team every day. Now, coming up later, is it pennies on the dollar for EA Sports and college football players? And we'll talk about what Ronald Acuna Jr. said and maybe what the Hawks need to do. And, of course, we're going to talk about the Braves standing on business during spring training. But first, let's get this party started with Soldier Field or the Benz, where do you think one is going to land next season? Now, the Falcons have become the betting favorites to land Justin Fields this week. Also, there's been drama swirling. It's like the young and the restless when it comes to Justin Fields, the Bears. Does he stay? Does he go? <laughs> he unfollowed the Chicago Bears on Instagram. Ooh. Ooh. Followed Bijan Robinson, <laughs> Drake London, and Kyle Pitts. Ooh. First of all, would Justin Fields be a fit in this offense? And listen, before we even talk about whether or not he's going to be a fit, it's interesting because there's always something out there that these players are putting into the ethos, right? And of course, Justin Fields didn't disappoint us because he had something to say on the St. Brown Brothers, Brothers podcast about this entire drama. I think they got a lot of playmakers on the team. Of course, Bijan. They got my boy Kyle. And then, of course, Drake. They probably need one more receiver, but they definitely got some guys over there. Okay. All right. Real talk. I appreciate that, Jarvis, that he came right out the rip and said, hey, here's what I see and what they're doing down in Atlanta. I think they've got some weapons, maybe are just a player away in the receiving room, but some might feel like Fields is the player away that the Falcons need. What do you think about how he fits in this offense? I think it'd be a perfect fit because when you think about what they've been able to commit to the running game by drafting a running back in the top 10 and, and Bajon Robinson and being able to expand his game and how he will help Justin Fields as a quarterback and how Justin Fields as a quarterback would help him as well. Because when you think about having that dual threat piece up under center, it just opens up the offense and makes it easier, right? And like the, it's from a language standpoint and then being able to have a new office coordinator and Zach Robinson coming in from that system out there that they run with the Rams run and being an 11 personnel and having those three wide receiver sets. I think it's just so it's endless, endless poss possibilities they can, they can do, they can have on, on Sundays when you comes to running that offense. Now I do from the drama standpoint, I feel, I do kind of understand because I just got a chance to check out that interview with yeah. the St. Brown brothers. To me, it just seems like he's ready to move on whether yeah. you know, however or, ready, or however it goes right because he wants to stay in chicago obviously he's under contract so he's not going to say hey um i don't i want to go somewhere else you know but i just think overall he's in a in a good space where hey i'm good either way but just go ahead and make the decision indeed and you kind of look at what he's doing or what he's done maria to jarvis's point he does bring that dual threat to what he was able to do even last season uh, 227 completions, 61% completion rate, not bad, 2,562 yards, and that's on the passing side of things. And, of course, we know that he was good on the rushing side. But I kind of wanted to highlight that passing piece as well because we know on the dual threat side sometimes his passing side of the dual threat doesn't get – it's underappreciated. But, Maria, in the world that we live in, do you feel like he, with that piece, coupled with what – the Falcons have mentioned as wanting an elite processor that he would be that fit for this organization. And do you also feel like it's not so much that there's drama that he's bringing the situation is drama, but it's, it's not that serious. Yeah. I mean, look, there's a lot of things that I think about when it comes to not only the drama around Justin Fields and his Instagram, but also Justin Fields getting back to Atlanta. I think, I think he'd be a wonderful fit. I tend to agree with Jarvis and you know, everyone says, Oh, he's from here. That would be so easy. I actually think that would make it harder on Justin to yeah. be here. And I think he understands that as well. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of people that want attention from 
NFL players in general, but especially when they're from the area, his phone, he even said, my phone blows up every time I go home. So I think it might be a little bit more difficult than people realize for him to actually play here. But when it comes to the quarterback ability, I think he's a great fit here. He's so young into his career. He's only completed three seasons in Chicago. And granted, the Bears have been going through a lot of changes themselves. So keep that in mind when evaluating Justin Fields over the last three years of his career. And I think that there have been times where he has shown you that he can be the next level quarterback that a lot of people thought he was coming out of college at Ohio State and obviously Georgia before that. Um, you know, Justin can't throw the football really well, and I think he can only get better. And yeah. I want to make sure that people understand that sometimes, whether it's football, baseball, basketball, doesn't matter. A change of scenery does an athlete a lot of good. And Chicago tends to be a really weird place for quarterbacks to play. I think if Justin gets a new change of scenery, he is a part of a coach, Zach Robinson, who's dealt yeah. with a quarterback himself that went through a change of scenery that was positive, Matthew Stafford. Um, I mean, look at Jared Goff when he went to Detroit. Look at what it did for his career. This could be great. And, and in turn, you don't really have to give up a lot of future picks for yeah. Justin, I think. And, and you're gambling a lot when it comes to, you guys know how I feel about quarterbacks in the draft. I think it's a gamble. It's it's harder to get that right than it is something that you already have a sample size from. So I tend to believe Justin would be a good fit here. The drama surrounding his Instagram is hilarious, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I do think he did unfollow just to take a break because we all are there. <laughs> We've all been there yeah. before. We need some distance whenever we're going on vacation or whatever he right. said. But I also do think he's starting to realize that, yeah, it's a business. Chicago seems like they're moving on. That decision's probably going to come through whenever Indianapolis is happening at the Combine. So, yeah. I don't know. Maybe he's putting uh, the cart before the horse or whatever the saying is. But I think it's funny that people just want to pay attention to who the heck he's following and unfollowing on Instagram. Like, who cares? Yeah. Oh, yeah. To, I, and I, I'm with you, Maria. I think this – I think if the, the Falcons are, are the front runners or the favorites, the betting favorites, you know, Vegas knows – you know, they know all and see all, right? They know, they know things. things. Yeah. You know, I think this this happens during sometime next week because yeah. when you think about being able to happen to make a decision because, you know, you know, obviously Chicago is going to probably try to reset that clock and go with a, a younger quarterback and more than likely sure. it's going to be Caleb Williams. And, and teams have to be able to figure out who they want. They have to start digging into the film and, and from a draft standpoint because once that combine happens, everybody's going into the film room and trying to figure yeah, out what's yeah. going on. So I think if they want to drive this price down, they'll wait and, and, and try to and, and, and try to um, get some see if they can get it to go back up. But I think you don't do anything but drive his value down the longer you wait, especially with the combine coming up next week. Yeah, yeah I'd agree. And I'd also say, going back to Maria's point about the inconsistencies, if you think about his first couple of seasons in Chicago, first of all, he rarely had weapons. And we're, we're talking about weapons to throw to and weapons to get, have an option to just pitch to. Like he's had serviceable running backs. He's had a receiver here or a receiver there. But when can you actually say that he's had a core yeah. across the wide receiver and tight end room. So first of all, let's talk about the fact that he, he acknowledged that as, as you guys uh, heard. And as we talked about as well, that there are weapons that this team has, they are. And we, we believe the same. We believe they're just one slot receiver. We believe they're just one player away from yeah. kind of rounding out that, that uh, offense to be really solid. And I think on the flip side of that, think about all of the very nuanced moves that Raheem Morris made and keeping consistency on his staff. So if there's staff consistency for and there's consistency with some of the other players, how easier, how much more easy or easier is it to just fit in that one guy and say, hey, here's kind of what we've been doing. We've got something established here. It's kind of easy. And I think I like the, the retention of a TJ Yates. I think that he's got a touch there, if you will. And we all know. Atlanta is the biggest small city in the world, right? And so you think of TJ Yates ties to Atlanta. You think of Justin Fields ties to Atlanta. You never know where there may be some nuances and some connection points there that may make this just a little bit easier of a transition than maybe the average quarterback. I do agree with you, Maria. I'm not so much on the bandwagon of bring him home, bring him home. But it's yeah. more of, but what could home do for him as far as the flowery branch home that he could be in? 
just think, a really quick point, go, if yeah, I can. Um, you know, a lot of people are talking about they need a younger quarterback. So some people are in the camp of let's draft somebody and have that person be developed for years to come. Well, Desmond Ritter was drafted in the third round. I don't necessarily believe that he was your immediate answer. And they've even come out and said that. And we all know how the Desmond Ritter piece worked out. But with Justin Fields, you're also still getting a young quarterback who will yep. have a so ton of years world. in front of him. Yep. So if you're talking about Russell Wilson, who has also been thrown out there linked to the Falcons, okay, maybe that'll work short term. Maybe mm -hmm. it won't. But still, how much longer can you see him being with this franchise? With Justin, if you get it right and move him to where a lot of people argue he maybe should have been in the first place, then he still has a ton of more years ahead of him. You already know what he can give you and where he can get better. I just think it's always going to be a gamble drafting some of those quarterbacks high first second third picks it's hard to get those right i think it's harder to get those right than bring someone like justin fields over just saying i think you'd be able to benefit from like that, that environment you talk about t with raheem morris and consistency in the staff and everything like that justin fields didn't have that at all in chicago you're talking yeah. about matt Nagy, who acted like he didn't believe him the way he called plays and on, on each and every sunday putting that boy in behind that offensive right. line <laughs> like like that was a big piece too because i yeah. think that's why it, um feels even more of a fit because of the, the continuity that the falcons have at offensive line he's never played by an offensive line that had, has been as cohesive as the falcons have had had and i think that you know with the whole offensive coordinator piece luke getsy him set him up for failure uh, on sundays as well so i think just the coming home yeah that's cool but I think the environment that is football related from yeah. a coaching standpoint, co coaching staff standpoint, all of those factors right there are, are something that Justin Field hasn't experienced before. That's why I yeah. feel like he'll be successful if he came down here. Yep, Raheem Morris is a different Raheem Morris from the one who could have gotten the job four years ago. That Justin sure. Fields is the one who is a different Justin Fields three years later from the guy who couldn't have, who could have gotten that job. When we come back, we are going to have a good old fashioned deep dive about Brave Spring training because our Maria Martin was down there in Northport and she's here to bring all the deets on the other side. This episode of our Atlanta Sports Party is brought to you by FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 bucks if your bet wins. Now, think about this. We're going into the final third of the Hawks season. Hopefully, they'll pipe up. And if they do, you might want to do a little betting on them, if you will. You can bet on all your favorite NBA players and your teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. You can get right back at it for the Hawks tomorrow night, of course, when they host the Raptors. So want to know how to do it? Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Get your 150 bucks. FanDuel is the official sports book partner of the NBA. All right, guys, so we have now wrapped up not just one man, how does the time fly, but two weeks of Braves spring training is essentially in the books. And you got to love so much that came out of Northport this particular week. I thought it was really good for Ronald Acuna Jr., for example, to set the stage. Don't know, Maria, that he had to apologize per se, but I just thought it was a nice look for him to say, first of all, you know, not speaking to the media. I apologize for that. That's something basically that won't happen again. I think he was level setting with everyone for exactly how he wanted to set the table and level setting in so many different ways has Ronald Acuna done it. But oddly enough, you know, the world we live in, we don't look at things like, wow, he comes out and he level sets the stage that way, or wow, he's out there blowing things out of the water when he's, you know, at, at bat and his ABs are just out of control already. And it's just the first or second week of spring training. No, we had to focus on the fact that he made a comment that essentially says, hey, I want to be a brave for life. And then everybody just kind of went overboard and what they thought those comments meant. But Maria, just being down there, being around Ronald Acuna Jr. and that team, do you feel like maybe going in about those comments, the, the feedback or the reception of it was a bit blown out of proportion? 
Braves fans blowing things out of proportion. I've never heard of that before. No. <laughs> and look, I love y'all. I love Braves fans. You guys are some of my favorite fan base. But seriously, I mean, they, it, 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 I just, I knew as soon as he said it, I was like, oh man, this is, this is going to be, this be is gonna be um, especially because, you know, Ronald's got about five years ish until he hits free agency. So we are jumping the gun a bit when it talks about you know him being a brave for life and this is very popular because the the core of this team is locked in for a long time and so um this is a luxury in baseball and something that is not done very often so i think people are getting a little bit spoiled and thinking you know we need everybody to be a brave for life and obviously ronald acuna jr would be at the top of that list because hello he was national league mvp i'm sure he's going to win quite a few more i mean Mm -hmm. this is only going to get better and it, it makes sense that people are already talking about this five years ahead yes. of this year's ahead of him hitting free agency. So yeah, of course I thought it was blown out of proportion, but it's great. You know, Ronald does live being around these guys. It's really obvious. We've watched him mature and grow in front of our eyes. Yeah a player um in the big leagues and and that in turn is where i think that apology came from. It was actually mm-hmm. a question I asked him and I didn't ask him anything about the um lack of comments from him in Philadelphia my right. question was simply about the NLDS and how long he thought about it after mm-hmm. they won. and he answered that at first and then turned yes. and apologized and that is just him showing growth and maturity because mm-hmm. you gotta remember too, a lot of these guys are still kids and they are growing yeah. out of our eyes and that's not making it an excuse for behavior in the past but um you know, I thought it was great that he did that. I also think it would be wonderful if he could be a brave for life. It just means Atlanta's got to pay him and they've got to pay him a lot of money. And that's where it becomes tricky for me in saying that I think Cunha could be here for the long haul, because as we've seen in recent history, the Braves have not liked to cough up certain amount of uh, dollar signs, but Acuna will need a lot of those. And I don't really know if the Braves could give that to him, but we'll see a lot can happen in, in the span of five years as we know. And I think that's where I leaned more. It wasn't so much about him talking about being a brave for life, but it's where my mind went to. And how much is that going to cost? And will <laughs> Liberty, right? Will Liberty Media cough it up or whomever? Forty might million be, dollars a year, right? <laughs> at a minimum, right? At minimum. a minimum, right? Yeah, right? yeah because start. we were talking about this earlier at, at my other gig, and the fact of the matter is. And, and I want to talk a little bit more about it in a second, but I, I want to give Jarvis an opportunity to chime in as well. He's understanding his brand. He's understand by ans- answering and having conversations in English. It may seem subtle by saying, I want to be a brave for life by getting there early to spring trade. All of the things that he's doing slowly, but surely he's understanding his international appeal and reach. And that goes back, Maria, to the maturity, to the point where I was like, I wonder who's mentoring him. Like who's in his ear in a good way, sharing yeah. with him. Like, do you know who you are? Like, do you know the power that you can yield right now in the space that you're in? I think he talk, he's moving into this whole, uh, uh, just his own brand in the Major League yes. Baseball, not only in the yes, city of right? Atlanta. No, like when yeah. you start transitioning, like he, like you said, he has those people in his ear, like whoever those people are, those yeah. people should be paid a lot of money because when you start doing, having conversations in English and, you know, people start, and you really expressing yourself and how you truly feel, because, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. people don't really trust the translators, you know, sometimes, you know, you, Franco's you know, the best though. Like, I will say that. We Definitely. know Franco's not... the man, but a lot of other people are like, is that all? Yeah. 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 Really yeah, yeah. Did you really say that? You know, yeah. so you got the naysayers out there. So, but I, I think overall he's moving into, he's putting himself in the conversation where he can be the face of major league baseball. And you know how a lot of times, you know, uh, people talk about, you know, how the respect from Atlanta, you don't really get it from a national yeah. media perspective. I think that's yeah. at the window with, 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 with nephew, with nephew Ronnie, like he's in that category and not yeah. just for him to. And then when I heard the comments, I was just like, man, I don't want to have these conversations. I'm sorry, because guess what, guys? Freddie Freeman, <laughs> Dansby Swanson, and Max Freed is happening. It's yeah, going down. Yeah, he's yeah, not. Yeah. He, he's, he's more than likely yeah, he's gone. So let's not ready. start having these sped, sped up conversations about my nephew running because I love watching this dude yeah, play, and it. I know that number is twenty two million, and they ain't going a penny over it. So <laughs> I know that he ain't taking that. You know, five years from now. So yeah, right. let's just enjoy these five years and just hey. 
that's that's the national media is hating because they want to see them on the team that they like. So like, so let's not have that conversation right now. So yeah, I want to see my nephew running. Baseball. Who doesn't yeah, want absolutely exactly. hands down embarrassment, hands down. embarrassment of riches that the the Braves have actually because so many of the Braves actually made that top twenty as you guys know. MLB Network has been counting down the best players in Major League Baseball, and you probably saw this clip where, of course, Ronald Junior Ronald Acuna Junior is ranked the highest of the Braves. He's ranked the highest of all the players. He's number one. But Absolutely. interestingly enough, when they were having the interview or, or conducting the interview, they were like fanboying. Like it was hilarious yeah. to me because these are like Hall of Famers and and longtime baseball broadcasters. That's how much energy and excitement there is. Like you said past this Atlanta Metro about him and about what these Braves can do. And one of the things I loved was when they asked him, so are you looking at 50, 50? He's like, why not? Like it could happen. And I thought about that. And here, I want to read this to you guys just real quick. Uh, you've got Austin Riley at 15 on that top 100 for MLB, just uh, Spencer Strider at 17. So you literally have three, exactly three Braves in the top 20. And you think about that. That's like, a fifth of the players, the Braves are taking a third of those spots. Like that's mind blowing. And yeah. this Maria goes back to what AJ Mentor said and what pretty much this Braves team in some way, shape or form has co-signed on, which is we got the moxie, we've got the attitude, we got the confidence that we're going to get back. We see it as World Series or bust. I just love all of that energy and for them to be on the same page unabashedly about what they can do in this upcoming season. Yeah, I mean, look, it's been a while since I've been around a team like this where there is such a hunger and desire to yes. be at the top once again. And I think it's because obviously a, a large majority of this team has been at the top in 21 mm -hmm. and the last two years were largely disappointing for everybody in that room. I was in the room when they lost both those times. And it, it it's clear to me that setting the tone and being vocal yeah. about it early is important to them. And, and all of them have said, you know, you can attack this one or two ways. And remember the postseason in baseball is very long. The baseball season in general is so long. So when you're looking ahead to October and November of the postseason, like we have so long to go and they understand that, but they also understand that it's important to go ahead and put your goals out there and tell them, Hey, we were perhaps the best team in baseball last year. And we fell short of our goal and that's mm -hmm. not good enough. And for a roster top to bottom, that has gotten better than last year. Thanks to Alex Anthopoulos and what he did in the off season, especially building that pitching depth, which in my mind was really their demise in the postseason. Yeah. They believe that they have the pieces in place. A lot can play into that. A lot can happen between now and October, but these are guys that are not scared to tell everyone we are going to be better than we were last year. Consistently all the way until October, we need to win a World Series. And there are guys, even new pieces that came on. Chris Sale did yes. not win in 21 with this team, but he does have a World Series championship ring. They all understand they're all on the same page. And that goes to anything that you do in companies, yeah. in your day-to-day -day life. If everyone is on the same page, a lot of really awesome stuff can happen. So to yeah. set that early... I love that AJ Mentor did it. He's one of the longest standing Braves in this clubhouse. There's not a lot of guys around from the 2017 team anymore. He's one of them. And so for him, it's important to take that leadership into account and to be mm -hmm. honest and vocal. Um, then all of them shared the same sentiment, which I thought was really cool. There wasn't a single yeah. one of them that was like, ah, we shouldn't be talking about this yet. No, at all. And Jarvis, I look at this and granted, we're only talking about 22 and 23, a smaller sample size coming into 24. But as mm -hmm. this long time, Atlanta native and there and of course longtime Braves fan. My question is, does it feel different than when they went on that run where they only got the one World Series and had what 13 division titles and only the one World Series? Does this feel different? Or, and when I say that, just wanted to ask you that quick question as we wrap up. Because for me, and I'm a longtime Braves fan too, it feels <laughs> different. Like I don't feel like we're gonna, you, Marie, and I are gonna be having this conversation three, four, five years in a row where we're like, dang won the division again, the World Series, won the division again, the yeah. World Series. Do you feel like this is a different situation than we experienced back then? It, it feels different because, and the reason why is because of, like we talked about, the long-term sustainability of the roster, right? Because you think about the core of this of this lineup is going to be here. They ain't going nowhere. You know, yeah. This is not the NFL where you can sit out and request trades. You know, I know Ronald Cooney could potentially do that, but they don't do that in baseball. 
Yeah. Hey, that 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 union is very strong, and they are strong for a reason because they follow the rules that they try to set. <laughs> you know, <laughs> against Major League Baseball and ownership. So yeah, that's why it feels different to me because like the roster is going to be here, and my only concern is the pitching staff because. We, Lord knows what the money is right there. Ain't nobody taking no discounts when it comes to pitching, you know, and we know they just mentioned Max Free earlier. So that's my only small concern, but just overall from this roster up and the lineup and being able to put runs on the, on the board and, 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 and win some games. Yeah. I, 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 this, this definitely feels different than those, those nineties Braves. Fair enough. And you know, I am not as concerned because two things, number one, Alex Anthopoulos said, hey, four years ago when he could have shored up the bullpen and he didn't and those guys got kind of tired and it kind of showed he learned a lesson. And, you know, Alex doesn't make the same mistake twice. And Bryce Elder and Ian Anderson are hungry. So we always like it when we've got guys who are hunger and hungry and eager to show, hey, we know there's a fit spot out there and we might kind of want to sort of get in there. Listen, we'll come back up next and we got more for you in Around the Metro. So it was as the world turns for Justin Fields, and it's going to continue to be as the world turns for him for a little while or Young and the Restless or whatever one of those soap operas is. But it's also like soap opera-ish, merry-go-round-ish when it comes to college football. And we experienced that ourselves right here when we got the surprising kind of shocking news that Sean Elliott was moving on from Georgia State to go back to South Carolina and become the tight ends coach fast forward. And this week you had Brian McClendon part ways with the dogs. He took on the wide receiver's role that he had at UGA's now with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, of course. Now, multiple reports have confirmed that running backs coach Del McGee over at UGA, as well as Georgia Tech offensive coordinator Buster Faulkner, are both finalists to take over that head coach position at Georgia State. And wow, one of those guys, I'm sure either of those guys would be amazing for that program. But Jarvis, it kind of got me wondering which one of those leaders if if one of those coaches parts ways with that program like which program do you think is going to be most affected by the departure i feel like buster faulkner leaves georgia tech yeah. with the momentum that they've they've gotten with him coming in and getting that offense right and looking capable of scoring points you know on each and every saturday i feel like that would be a major blow especially at this moment right now where there aren't any other, you know, uh, open positions. Aren't guys and not, guys aren't out there looking for jobs? And like we, we're late in the game. Like spring practice is started for this for Georgia State, and they had to pause, right? So I think right now, yeah, it it will be that would be a major major blow to, to the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets and their future and the optimism that's going on over in the flats right now. Yeah, that'd be a huge blow if Buster Faulkner would walk out that door. How about you, Maria? You think it's Buster Faulkner's departure or Del McGee's that'll have the biggest impact to their program? I think it's definitely Buster, right? Del McGee obviously has an unbelievable pedigree in what he's churned out at Georgia. He got six running backs drafted. Three of them have become pro bowlers. Probably going to have more running backs drafted after this year's draft. I mean, that's insane. So you'll look at that on paper and you think, oh my gosh, that's a massive loss. And it is, but you know, Kirby's dealt with this over the last couple of years. That's what happens when you start winning national championships. Coaches move on, they get bigger jobs. Nick Saban had to deal with that at Alabama and Kirby oh, has yeah. handled that really well. So um, that, that, that doesn't mean I don't think that Dell has an incredible impact and I think he can be an amazing head coach, but kind of going back to Jarvis's point, I mean, Buster Faulkner has something going on the flats that is really hard to replicate and it's really hard. Yeah. I think it's harder to get a better hire over there and to mm -hmm. do what he's been doing, especially with Hayden King. He's taken a step forward in his career. Yeah. That would be such a bad thing to throw a wrench into that right now, but Heck, if Del McGee gets hired as the head coach of the Georgia State Panthers, slam dunk hire for them. Absolutely. That would be fantastic. Yeah, and I thought the same. Good for for Georgia State if it's Del McGee. Nothing against Buster Faulkner, but I think Haynes King had a lights out season, and he can only get better. But the continuity is probably going to be one of the most critical pieces there as well. Now, speaking of whew, some things that are, yeah, yeah, you, exactly. Oh. You all know after we know it. Where's my sensor? Because exactly. Get ready to bleep, bleep me or do whatever you got to do oh. because a team that's actually trying not to go down in flames, the Hawks. The Hawks are entering the final stretch of their season, right? The regular season, that is. And it's interesting because we don't really know what to make of this team, which is why you don't know what's a fair expectation for this team. 
is it play in Maria? Is it playoffs? Or is it one of those seasons where you kind of feel like it's going to end in the regular season and that's kind of the fair expectation for them, given what you've seen out of them so far? So we're halfway through, right? And I feel like we've been saying the same thing since the beginning of the year. Oh, like, we've right never, down been, like, what is going on? You know, like, uh, nobody can figure it out. And oh I'm serious. Like, Not we, even the coach. Could, we could cut and paste what I cut said. And like six weeks ago. Exactly what Maria <laughs> said, what Jarvis said. I, I'm not kidding. Like, but I, I still think that this is a team that tends to um, surprise us. Is that the best, most politically accurate way to say it? So I think that uh, play it. You know, if you if you were going to ask me right now, I would say that they wouldn't be in the playoffs just based off of the sample size that we've gotten. And grant, granted, I know there's been injuries and there's been other things that have been happening, but. I still think they're a play-in team because they tend to overachieve in what we all believe that they can do. But they are one of the most confusing teams that I've ever covered. I still don't understand why things are not working. And I still don't think it's Quinn Snyder's fault. So someone figure it out because I don't think we can. Yeah, because you've switched coaches. This is now a third switcheroo if you don't take Mike Bullnoser into the consideration since he walked away before the rebuild. And it's right. like, okay. The math ain't math because the, the the that seat right there, we keep switching it and nothing's like changing. And to your point, Maria, it is very befuddling because every time you think they've shown you who they can, who they are, it's like, no, 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 it was who they can be. And so they'll show you shades of it, but they're never going to really, they never seemingly are able to kind of catch, like really catch fire and keep yeah. fire. And That's even so today, yeah, it really is because you get excited and unlike the Braves who will take us on a ride and they might, you know, dump us off for a hot second, but we know they're going to bring us back, right? Yeah. The Hawks, very much the polar opposite. And then to Maria's point, Jarvis, you never know, like, what's going to happen with them. But one thing is for certain, if they can't figure it out on defense, then there's no way that I see them getting past the regular season. And at practice today, Quinn Snyder confirmed. Onyeka Okongu, who, of course, went out with the left big toe sprain in that Bulls game just before the All-Star break. He's out, forget this, the foreseeable future. Clint Capella, who's still out with the left adductor strain, they said he was coming back to practice this week. Now, they're saying he's missed a few weeks. He'll likely be on a minutes restriction, but I feel like that's almost rushing him back, which is probably going to be the worst thing you could do along the stretch. That's why I'm still thinking... I don't know if I see them getting out of the regular season because you have no defense already. And the guys that give it to you, one, you don't know when he's coming back and the other's going to come back hobbled and was already hobbled before, uh, was already showing us, I'm sorry, Jarvis, a shell of his former self before he left anyway. Yeah, I don't, if we just talking about the Hawks specifically, yeah, I don't see them getting out of the regular season, but look at what's going on around him, right? Like you got the, the yeah. Brooklyn Nets yeah, the, who right. just fired their coach. Right. So yeah. Yeah, but they might get a fired pump their coach. Because they <laughs> might be excited, like, ooh, Kevin Ollie, the new guy. Right. You know, Kevin Ollie, they might get a bump, but they might be like, hey, let's go ahead and uh tank it. Wrap this thing on up and tank it and <laughs> see what happens there. So right. and then you got the Bulls that's right right there, you know, um in front of them as well. So we'll have the tiebreaker, but moving on. All right, yeah. So I I, th I think that, you know, if they do get into the play in, it's because of what's going on around them, more yeah. so than what they're actually doing out there on the basketball court. Yeah, they'll that's back fair. into it. Yeah. yeah. Now now that part I could see them possibly backing into it, although the Miami Heat are always going to do the Miami Heat things, and the Magic are looking super good. And listen, guys, there, there's always so much to talk about. But if you appreciate that and you love everything about this show, of course, we thank you for stopping by. But we also want you to check out so many other shows that we have where we're talking all things Atlanta sports. Our Atlanta YouTube channel is now streaming live 24-7, so you can get all of this all day, every day. And don't forget to like and subscribe our YouTube channel. We are also free and available wherever you download your podcast. We will see you on the Atlanta Football Party on Monday.